Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today to discuss deficit and strength-based approaches to research. My name is Christina Onea, and I am a research associate at Citizens Committee for Children. For those of you who might not be as familiar with us, Citizens Committee for Children, or CCC, is a nonprofit or child advocacy organization that combines public policy research and data analysis with citizen action to ensure that every New York City child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. I'm joined today by my colleagues from the research and data team, and I'm going to pass along to them to introduce themselves so you can get to know us a little bit. And I ask that you really do make use of the chat to introduce yourselves as well so we know who is in this space with us. I can go ahead and pass it on to Bijan to start. Hi, everybody. Bijan Kimirgar. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Research at Citizens Committee. Nice to see familiar names and new names. Uh, Rimshar, I'll pass it to you. Hi, everyone. I'm research associate at um, CCC. Um, my name is Rimsha, and I work mainly on the economic security and housing portfolio, and I'll pass it on to Maria. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. My name is Dragnik Maria. I'm a senior associate on the data team, and I've been at the, CCC, at the Open Data Week for the past couple of years, and very happy to join this session. Thank you so much, team. So before we begin, Yuzhan, if you would go to the next slide. I would like to emphasize that our session today will function later on as a workshop, and we encourage as much participation as possible. We'll begin by reviewing deficit and strength-based framing. We'll then look at one of CCC's tools and how we're moving toward the opportunity to transition toward strength-based framing of child and family well-being, including through asset mapping. We'll then move on to breakout rooms to share our experiences with these two kinds of experiences approaches and experiences, which I'm sure you all have a lot of. If you go to the next slide, Bijan, we can first determine the difference between these two approaches. Deficit-based framing relies on the measurement of deficiencies. Often there's a focus on risk, on problems, and comparison to groups that tend to have better outcomes. Deficit-based approaches, including those that come from a place of benevolence, have historically framed communities of color as pathologized as broken and often obscures the systemic influences that creates harmful conditions in these communities. Deficit-based frameworks measure risk, which offer, often per perpetuates victim blaming by holding historically oppressed populations accountable for any shortcomings that are found. This means that there is a failure to recognize oppressive systemic structures and policies placing historically oppressed people in a vacuum where it's assumed that communities should be entirely responsible for their own success and that everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed regardless of the socio-political structures that exist. This leads to a reinforcement of negative stereotypes that tend to pathologize communities. We know, however, that this is untrue. There are inequities based on our socio-political past and present that undeniably affect communities. And historical and current divestment from communities of color, for example, can lead to a lack of resources communities need in order to advance their well-being. Strength-based approaches, however, don't shy away from this reality. Strength-based approaches acknowledge inequities, but remain focused on identifying strengths and protective factors to encourage positive outcomes. With this framework, we can begin to move away from assessing risk and factors that decrease well being and toward assessing the factors that promote well being. The goal is to empower communities by building on identified assets to foster positive narratives of strength and resilience. But moving toward this can be very difficult. There are deep tensions in moving away from a dominant framework, and we really might ask ourselves where do we even begin? Bijan, you can go to the next slide. So to apply this kind of transition to a real world example, we can discuss a bit about how we at CCC are reevaluating our tools to determine how we can build a strength-based focus in our work. Each year, CCC produces its Child and Family Wellbeing Index for New York City, which analyzes risks to child and family well-being concentrated across the 59 community districts in New York City, with each district ranked from highest to lowest risk. We analyze 18 indicators across six domains of child and family well-being. These domains are economic security, housing, health, 
education, youth, and family and community, which you could see on the side. We mostly use publicly accessible data for these domains, and we make use of the New York City Open Data site for several indicators, including high school graduation rate and the violent felony rate. The index offers a monitoring tool to measure progress on conditions within, inequi within and inequities between New York City communities, illustrating how community conditions are shaped by structural racism, drawing attention to where greater investments would promote health, equity, and well being. We do, however, um, have a critical view of this tool because of the deficit-based focus on risk. To mitigate this, we carefully package the data with context that acknowledges the ways in which communities at risk have been and continue to be impacted by harmful structures and policies. We leverage our data to push for policy recommendations that are often rooted in community-led solutions. And still we see a need for reimagining an inherited tool. For these reasons, we seek to strengthen this analytic tool and others like it with input from organizations working in underserved communities. Our goal is to ensure that this tool is useful as an analytic tool for equitable community development by moving away from a deficit-based framework toward a strength-based approach. This approach uses a participatory ethos to center the voices of historically oppressed communities and lean into those community-led solutions. If you go to the next slide, Bijan. One of the ways in which we're able to transition to strength-based framing is by making use of asset mapping. The asset map on our website, for example, uses the same domains from our child and family well-being index, but with different indicators that are more representative of community strengths. So some examples include the number of workforce development programs, housing support services, mental health facility, and after-school programs, though many more assets can be mapped. We use this map to identify community assets as the first step to building more strength-based policy recommendations. While measuring these assets can be empowering to communities, we need to be sure that we're correctly identifying assets. And to do this, we can lean on research about cultural assets, especially in communities that have been historically marginalized. As I mentioned before, it can be difficult to achieve this transition. By and large, we've grown accustomed to deficit-based framing as an easy way to draw attention to community needs. However, because this approach often does more harm than intended, we must make the transition and lean into the tensions. If you go to the next slide, you can see that one tension is that it can be difficult to measure strength-based indicators but it's necessary for our work because we cannot truly capture well-being or research on communities without including the assets that those communities consider to be important and protective. Black family cultural assets, for example, include extended kinship, social networks, religiosity and spirituality, optimism and role flexibility. But the difficulty in measuring these indicators is not a deterrent it's an opportunity for creativity and novel ways of imagining indicators and outcomes. On this slide, there are some initial ideas for ways to measure these important cultural assets, such as mapping places of worship, mapping and acknowledging multi-generational homes as assets, and surveys to measure attitudes toward optimism and role flexibility. By honoring and opening space for creativity and innovation, we could improve the validity of our tools and promote resilience building work. On the next slide, we can transition to our workshop portion of this session. We'd like to invite you to think about your own experiences and discuss strategies for making a shift toward strength-based narratives. So we'll discuss these questions in breakout groups and each group will have a CCC team member to help facilitate. And then we'll come back to a larger group to report back what we shared and learned in these small group discussions. Now, if you'll just give us a minute to assign people to breakout rooms, we can then begin. Thank you. Wonderful. So I think most of us are back at this point. Um, I'd love to hear a bit about what you discussed in your sessions and definitely looking for someone to start us off who would like to be that person. I'd love to hear about what you spoke about in your breakout group. I can uh, give a quick recap of what the group in my breakout talked about, and then anyone there can jump in and say what more they want to add. Um, one thing that I think was great is that we had a mix of backgrounds, um, children's health, child welfare, 
um, running groups, uh, folks from geographically focused groups. Um, we we talked, I think on one way, the deficit oriented thinking is actually helpful uh, in galvanizing support, especially in terms of writing grants and that we have to balance that with the strength-based approach. And so it's not so much a either or, but sometimes both can be uh, useful. Um, one thing that we were ending on just in the sake of being uh, brief. And like I said, folks from our, from our group, please chime in is this idea of it's not so much the absolute of where you fit in a ranking, right. But are you yourself improving? Are you um, it's what, what Allison and her group were calling the mastery climate. Uh, are you developing a mastery for yourself and, and improving? And in her situation, it's about, not winning a race, but improving your time, for example. Um, can that be a strength-based approach to this work? Uh, group mates, if there's anything else to add. I see snaps, Bijan, so you did a great job. Um, I'll move on to Rimsha's group. I think Maria took notes, so Maria, feel free to chime in. Um, I know as we were closing out, um, Nicholas also brought up a good point about thinking about the audience and how a lot of the deficit oriented language that we use is catered towards a certain um, fundraising audience when it, as it pertains to upper class or white audiences. So I thought that was an interesting point. Um, anyone else feel free to jump in. And I know we had Melissa from Teach for America who discussed um, rather than looking at inequities or inequalities and in proficiency scores when it came to um, education, rather than looking at that, looking in, at growth in communities over time and that being an example of a strength-based measure versus being deficit-oriented. That's wonderful. Does anyone else from Rimsha, Rimsha's group want to add? Maria? I, I think we have a few comments about like flipping certain indicators, like if we talk about absenteeism, like about the, the flip side and is it telling like a strength-based approach? And also like if we have a, we are actually involved in something that is definitely deficit-based, like a child welfare issues, uh, if we are seeing less of that, it is sort of like getting us towards a strength-based. I think these were a couple of other comments from our group. Great. And Alice from our group also sent me a message separately. Alice, feel free to chime in if you're free to do so. Um, this is more of a comment, sort of food for thought. Um, but she wrote, I think uh, this is, but something I think about is reframing negative measures as reflective of systems in place rather than of uh, oppressed populations themselves. For example, if attendance is low, maybe that's because a program isn't working for the population that it's supposed to serve. Thank you so much for that. Does anyone else from this group want to add anything onto that? Great. So in our group, I think we were pretty much along the same lines of the other two groups. We did talk about working within a dominant framework um, that is reinforced by RFPs, that is reinforced by studies themselves and how indicators that have been used forever are still being used um, and the difficulties of navigating that type of environment in a strength-based approach when that's not necessarily what's being required or requested and strategies to manage that, including leaning into um, recognizing the strength of networks, recognizing the strength of our partners and organizations that work with us and how we can rely on them for more data that might be strength-based um, and moving toward strength-based approaches by um, sort of trying to lift strengths over everything else. Um, overall, I really want to thank you all for such a generative discussion, and I hope that you will join us in leveraging this discussion from today to revise how we measure well-being at the community level and how to move to an asset-based approach to counter deficit-based thinking. We want to leverage equity-promoting language and practices in reporting findings from analytic tools, and that's part and parcel to dismantling structural racism and all forms of 
discrimination, excuse me. Um, so we thank you for this discussion and for thinking through this shift with us. But if there are any other last comments or questions that you'd like to share, please do so now. Otherwise, we really appreciate your attendance and wish you a wonderful day. Andrew maybe wants to add something. No, I, I just wanted to say that you guys did a wonderful job. I mean, I came towards the middle and I'm sorry, but I was having trouble to get on, so. No worries, thanks for being here. I have a quick uh, shout out if I can, Christina. I just wanna uh, say thank you to Sarah Workman who's being part of here. We see you as a data guru in so many ways and we look to you for a lot of advice. So thank you for being here and contributing to the conversation. Um, I had a I have a observation based um, as as the world and as CCC and as you help us uh, look at the world through a more asset based lens. I would also caution us all when we are evaluating data from some of those open sources to remember that data from our city and state and federal agencies is sometimes shaped with um, agendas in mind and designed to be as positive as possible in many cases. And that can mask needs and it can mask um, how we approach creating positive solutions in a community. And as an example, I'm just gonna randomly make up some numbers, but I've been involved in education policy for a long time. And as the past 20 years, as graduation rates went up and dropout rates went down, when you add the, the numbers together, it was like a big chunk, like 25% of the kids weren't accounted for in those numbers. Mm. So I, I, it's the grain of salt to sprinkle on um, our public data as we try to use it to make the world a better place. Absolutely. And that's honestly, in my view, another strength-based approach to improving data for all of our use. We really thank you for bringing that to this discussion as well, Sarah. We appreciate it. Would anyone else like to say anything before we go? Uh, oh, I noticed that a lot of students that graduated uh, the college and they graduated um, high school, many of them have not gotten into the fields that they really studied for. They're having difficulty in uh, going in the field that they graduated for. It's that, um, like for instance, uh, well, thank God she, um, she's graduating as a nurse, um, my uh, goddaughter, who's my niece. And uh, she started early to work in internship in the field, and what was what was good about it is that the school um, gave her the opportunity to do the internship way before she would even graduate to give her an opportunity of where she wants to fit as a nurse. So some schools, I believe, should do that more, um, help them. Uh, try different uh, skills as well? I don't know. What do you think? So I think that that can absolutely be another example where we can use strength-based approaches and see where students are succeeding and how to help them continue to succeed in those areas. Um, I think that's a wonderful place to think about um, new ways of approaching the issues that exist. At this point, since we have a couple of minutes left, oh, Maria, would you like to say something? Uh, yes, I wanted to say that I dropped uh, the links to three publications that we are actually producing with kind of this kind of 
framework of having a set number of indicators. So we just kind of want to invite you to stay in touch with us as we try to reevaluate and improve these tools. And we might actually come back to you all and kind of seek more specific uh, thoughts on our indices in particular uh, as we co continue with this work. So it's that's my... Thank you so much, Maria, for that. And Jazzy, I'd love to give you um, closing remarks. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Christina, Bijan, Maria, Rimsha, um, all of Citizens Committee for Children. Um, 